Hey everyone, it's Barry here. Hope you enjoy the episode and visit us at barrykibrick.com to become part of our community of patrons. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick, and I have not been able to escape on a daily basis the expression, we are a divided nation. Yet the more people I meet and talk with, I'm convinced we are all dealing basically with the same issues. And not only are we dealing with these same issues, but as a country, we are united on all fronts in regards to them. Today, I want to give you my take on this subject, along with other matters that I have a different perspective on, and believe you too might just feel the same way. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. Whatever you read, see on television or the internet, or hear from your friends and family or your social media connections, everyone comments that we are a divided country. Well, I'm here to emphatically let you know we are not. In fact, it is just a meme. The term meme was coined by a past guest on this program, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. Here is the definition as he defines it. An element of a culture or system of behavior that may be considered to be passed from one individual to another by non-genetic means, especially by imitation. In other words, if it gets repeated enough, it feels like it's real. So I'm going to explore today that the notion we are a divided nation is simply a meme. It's not a conspiracy. There is no cabal or oligarchy that is behind it. It's just being passed on because each of us, we're all feeling that we are not really dealing with reality, but again, just a feeling. In fact, I plan to show that not only are we not a divided nation, but truly a united country with almost no divisions at all. And the little divisions that do exist are extremely exaggerated. Let's start with four key institutions that we all can relate to and affects all of our lives. Our government, our media, health care, and education. First, an overview. Virtually all of us have lost some faith in all four. Now the key word is some, because we also know that without reasonable trust in government and media, we crumble. But we want more from both of those institutions. And everyone does, not just some. As for health care and education, we also want the best in both. And for the most part, we do pretty well. But cost for medical care is outrageous, and no one can disagree. And a great education for all is something everyone wants as well. But our teachers get often tangled up in oversized bureaucracies and spend more time prepping students for tests than they do educating them in the best possible way. It's definitely not what they desire. But there is no division on this. Everyone agrees. Everyone is on the same page. We want more efficient and effective government on every level. That's county, city, state, and federal. We want a more sensible media that gives us the information we need with great journalism and less hyperbole and partisanship. We want the best medical care but without going bankrupt every time we need any procedure. And all, all of us want the best possible education for all of our children. 
So not only are we not divided on these issues, but we are completely united on them all. Now here's where there may be some division on each. It's in the how do we fix it all department. But if we agree on the what and agree on the why, even if we are completely divided on the how, we are still very far from being a divided nation. And the quicker we realize that, the quicker we can work together to fix the how. And what is the first step we need to make that realization? That answer may literally reside in a notion that is as old as the first bits of wisdom that came from our ancient Greek philosophers. And that simply is to know thyself. From the ancient Greek philosophers to Lao Tzu to Buddha to Adam Smith to Walt Whitman to Rumi to Nietzsche, to name any great intellect that ever lived, all believed in the importance of knowing oneself. Obviously, many wise men and women believe you must know yourself in order to be the best you can be. And they are right. The problem arises when you think you know yourself, but not necessarily the real self. Only the negative self that gnaws at you. I know, because I've been gnawing at myself way longer than I need. The question then becomes, how do I get to know myself? the way the great philosophers and thinkers throughout time meant it, so that it leads to a better life and understanding rather than self-loathing. According to psychiatrist Dr. Peggy O'Connor, she writes this, Seeing your authentic self is like looking for a unicorn. I therefore ask myself the obvious question. How much do I need to know myself? And what do I do if and when I figure it out? But it does imply that knowing oneself is a continuous quest. You do not need to achieve it. You just have to keep searching for it. For many of those great thinkers and sages of old, that is what they really meant. In fact, I use the term quest rather than journey because when one goes on a journey, they have a destination. But when one goes on a quest, it is to find something unknown with no specific destination in mind. The great neuroscientist and renowned atheist Sam Harris, in my opinion, is a very spiritual man in a very Sam Harris way. Yes, that caught me by surprise, but just read his book, Waking Up, and you too will agree, even if he may not. He looks at knowing oneself as the ultimate form of consciousness and states it in a way that just might take some of the pressure off having to know oneself before one can act as if one does. Sam writes, Consciousness is what matters but concludes that it's a mystery exceeded only by the mystery that there should be something rather than nothing in the first place. Now, who does not enjoy a good mystery? Personally, I don't. <laughs> I would much rather have answers than questions. I am fully convinced that my questions prevent me from getting a good night's sleep. But there really is something to be said about putting, if not an end, at least a moratorium on questioning. In fact, this is something actually that I have achieved. I basically stopped questioning almost everything and just started taking action. No questions asked. None. Not a single question ever asked. 
How did I mention there is this? Uh, I guess I didn't. There is a slight drawback, and that is the many mistakes and failures this has led me to, which is why I've become the best apologizer on the planet. Why is it important to apologize? After all, who's to blame if it isn't my fault? There is nothing more powerful than making a mistake and then apologizing. Marshall Goldsmith, business guru and life coach to some of the most powerful people and organizations, including dozens of CEOs of the top companies in the world, says this. Apologizing is a magic move. Apology is where behavioral change begins. I find that on many occasions, it is better to make an error in judgment and then apologize rather than never making the error. I must confess, I have even made errors not so much on purpose, but knowing full well if I did what I'm planning, it would probably cause me to apologize and that would be a good thing. Now remember, I'm an artist at this, so don't poo-poo the strategy so fast. When you act spontaneously and without much thought, a now finely tuned quality of mine, you are bound to find yourself in situations where something you did goes terribly or at least partially awry. However, by admitting I was wrong, people really started seeing that my character was good. And in business and in life, character counts much more than anything else. Eli Holtzman, the creator and producer of Undercover Boss, told me this on my show. Any boss, any person will tell you that being emotionally open Making yourself vulnerable requires not only bravery, but also a real strength of character. I learned quickly that by reacting properly to my mistakes and quickly apologizing rather than agonizing, not only did my character grow in the eyes of others, but even in my own harsh eyes. Come on now, really. Did you think I always feel terrible? After all, this is a quest, and it is bound to produce some results. The real question remains, however, how do you keep yourself in that state? What is that something I need to fill the insatiable appetite for happiness, fulfillment, and well-being? Could it be living in the now or some form of physical or mental exercise? I've had so many guests say that it could be accomplished through meditation. If we can still our mind, that might just be the solution. So now a little meditation on meditation. In other words, mindfulness, TM, and why won't my monkey brain stop spinning? In my most recent conversation with Dr. Deepak Chopra on this show, he told me that he meditates for two hours every day. My reply was, I thought that was about an hour and 45 minutes too much. And if you get a chance to catch that episode on my YouTube channel, you'll see why I said it. Now, one of the most endearing guests I had the pleasure of having on Between the Lies was Baba Ramdas, the famous guru who literally wrote the book on living in the now. He, too, spoke of the importance of meditation. He writes, Meditation will help you quiet your mind, enhance your ability to be insightful and understanding, and give you a sense of inner peace. There is no doubt that Deepak and Baba, 
although having very funny names, are onto something. And I know that if I did meditate, my life would be better for it. Yet, as certain as I am about that statement, I personally have not been able to pull it off. I don't even have a good excuse, except to say it just has not happened. And since I've known about its benefits for over 35 years, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen anytime soon. And even with my greatest effort, I never went longer than 10 minutes, which as you'll soon see, may just be enough. First, a little primer on what I know about meditation. There are different types of many, and many different types of meditation, but the two most discussed on my program and throughout the world are Transcendental Meditation, or TM, and Mindfulness Meditation. TM is essentially the classic mantra practiced and developed in India and the first one introduced to Westerners. Typically, in TM, one relaxes and attempts to withdraw momentarily from the world around them through the use of a, a repeated mantra. Most people say that about 20 minutes a day of this form of meditation is ideal, and many scientific studies have shown that it can be, and in fact, it can do everything from increased life experience, to life expectancy, to calming the monkey brain chatter within us, giving one a refreshed perspective. I know people who do practice this form of meditation and swear to its benefits, and I also know it is working for them. Mindfulness, excuse me, mindfulness meditation is another practice I first learned. And I learned of this from a guest I mentioned before, neuroscientist Sam Harris. This form also goes by the name of insight meditation. In this form of meditation, rather than going into a state of withdrawal, one sits upright with a deep sense of alertness, attending to the flow of ordinary experiences and thoughts occurring at the moment. This could mean focusing on commonplace things happening at the time, or sometimes even uncomfortable thoughts, sounds, and patterns that are just going on during the moment that you are meditating. I also know many practitioners of this form of meditation, and they too feel a sense of calm, concentration, and renewal that helps them in so many ways. Both practices, according to everything I've read and heard from the authors who wrote about them and the people who follow them, do build calm and concentration, although in different ways. In TM, one relaxes while withdrawing and lets the rhythmic sounds of a mantra replace the annoying sounds of one's internal and usually non-productive exasperating thoughts. In mindfulness, one gains consciousness when each moment of ordinary experience is penetrated with awareness. As I stated earlier, either one works if you can do them. However, I cannot, at least not for more than 10 minutes. And that's on a peaceful, meditative kind of day which I do have at least once or twice a year. That, the setting aside of even 10 minutes for me to sit still and calm my mind is very remote. Yet knowing the importance of stopping that useless monkey brain chatter is a mission I still seek. And I have from time to time been able to pull it off. It's just that the hangover from how I did it never seemed to be the way to go. So if you can set aside 10, 20, 30 or so minutes for meditation, I hear only great things about it. And if you already do, then I am sure you are experiencing its wonders as well. However, since I cannot, I took what I could do 
and began using a 30-second form of meditation. I termed this form of meditation a moment of meditation. That's M-O-M, or MOM, as I like to call it. It requires no guru, no extensive sitting, chanting, or any real action of any type. In fact, like most moms, they just want you to call them once in a while so they know you're okay. The same holds true for moment of meditation. Mom, picture this. You're at work and cannot focus because all you're thinking about is something you should have done and did not or need to do and have yet not. I use this example because that is my natural state and therefore a perfect time to put mom to work. Do not find a quiet place. Do not even make a move. If you are at your desk, fine. If you're watching TV, fine. If you're driving your car, not fine. Just put on a pleasant song on the radio. In all other cases, where you are not op operating heavy machinery, then it is fine. Stay where you are and take three deep, gentle breaths with eyes closed. And let's really do this together right now. I may be crazy, but that feels better already. Now focus for a moment on the issue spinning in your mind that is most annoying at the time. Key in as deeply as you can on the issue. Time does not matter. You only want to be clear what that issue is. If I can see it in my mind's eye, what the problem is, if I can see it, I resolve it on the spot, at least the spot in my mind at the time. After all, it is only a thought, so I either unthink it, if it is a negative, or dwell on it, if it feels positive. The three breaths that, for that brief moment in time, relax me enough to deal with the question are important. And then the answer came to me. And at this moment, the answer is as old as the Bible itself. In fact, it is in the Bible. It comes from the story of King Solomon, who was feeling very down and out in a moment of desperation. And he did so, and he asked the wise men of his council to create something that would make him not feel so unworthy and glum. His wise, wise men did just that. They presented the king with a ring, and the inscription on the ring read, This too shall pass. Now let us get back to that overall gray cloud of plain uneasiness that I cannot part with. I wish I could make this more complex, because then I could charge large speaking fees at seminars and colleges, or at least give an exciting TED Talk. Truth is, it is the same routine. I take those three deep breaths, see the gray cloud swirling, and know at this time it cannot be resolved. But like the wise men told King Solomon, it too shall pass. But personally, what really would help me is if I had my own wise men to call upon whenever this occurs. As we conclude this episode, I know I brought up many topics, some of them controversial, that you might have questions or comments about. So go to barrykibrick.com and you'll see the episode and I will respond to every question and comment you have personally. As you know by now, I always like ending my show with a quote from my guest's book. Since I have no book or guest, I'd like to leave you with these words that I often use as a toast before I have a drink. Therefore, I've had plenty of time to memorize them. They are from a dear guest I've had on my show, the great poet-philosopher John O'Donoghue. It's from his book, To Bless the Space Between Us, a book that I believe everyone should have in their home. This particular blessing is titled, 
to come home to yourself, and it goes like this. May all that is unforgiven in you be released. May your fears yield their deepest tranquility. And may all that is unlived in you blossom into a future graced with love. I'm Barry Kibrick. I know that you'll all want to rewind and write that down, but no need. Just visit my website at barrykibrick.com and I'll have it posted there for all of you to see and share. And between now and then, may your future be graced with love. To become part of the Between the Lines family, go to barrykibrick.com. There you can join our book club, participate in Q&As, catch past episodes, listen to Barry's podcasts, read his blog, and experience exclusive online features, all at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com.